This is Lisa from This Jungian Life. We're excited to announce the launch of This Jungian Life Learning, an online educational platform that offers a chance to dive into Jungian topics more deeply. Our first offering will be a 12-month program called Dream School. The three of us will guide you in learning how to interpret your dreams so that you can learn the language of the unconscious. Jung said, in each of us there is another whom we do not know. He speaks to us in dreams and tells us how differently he sees us from the way we see ourselves. Learning to work with our dreams can help us hear the perspective of this other, leading to an abiding sense of aliveness, renewed creativity, and greater psychological wholeness. Dream work can help us resolve inner conflicts, shift how we approach interpersonal relationships, and help us to find our authentic ground. We're hoping to launch Dream School later on this summer. If you'd like to be one of the first to hear about it, please go to our website, thisjungianlife.com, and click on the banner link at the top to sign up for our email newsletter. Thank you. Welcome to this Jungian Life Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Many listeners have requested that we talk about creativity, so we thought we would take that on this week. When we started thinking about this topic, one of the things that really became so clear to us is how important creativity was to Jung. He himself was a very creative person. He had a lot to say about creativity. And certainly one of the key ideas for Jung is that creativity comes from the unconscious. And this was a big difference between Freud and Jung because Freud's view of the unconscious is a place that could serve as a repository for things that never quite made it above the level of consciousness, things that were repressed or forgotten. And Jung said, yes, it's all of those things And the unconscious can give birth to wonderful new creative impulses. So we're just going to keep that in mind today as we discuss this topic, that creativity is very linked to the unconscious. And it also has uh, real links to the gods. The ancient Greeks thought that creativity came from the gods. Zeus had nine daughters, the muses, and each of them had a different name that I that I don't remember, but nine aspects of of creativity, which ties in very much with what you were saying, Lisa, about Jung and creativity, that it comes from the unconscious and it has archetypal roots. It's very deep and it's inherent in the human spirit. We all have an urge to create, whether it's a garden or a symphony. And because it rises up out of the unconscious, sometimes unbidden, there's a great feeling of the import of it, that something substantial, something beyond my conception of my ego self has been gifted. So often creative persons talk about feeling a responsibility to tend and bring forward something that is truly creative that's risen up through them. We might even say that the creative object demands incarnation in some sense. And many artists talk about being pestered by their creative ideas. Jung actually talked about it. I don't know if it was an interview or he'd written this someplace, but I recall him writing that he felt exhausted sometimes by the creative spirit that it would not allow him to rest or to be indolent or to be avoidant, but was constantly asking him to bring things forward, which was well, made his life prolific. Uh, as anyone knows, looking at his canon of readings, his writings rather, 
but also came at a cost to his personal life. Yeah, I mean, I'm, th- I'm thinking what we're lifting up here is that the creative urge is universal. We all have it. And Jung actually said that the creative instinct was one among several key instincts. So this is just an essential part of human life. But I like what we're all doing with lifting up the connection with the divine. And I'm thinking about the etymology of the word. Uh, It comes from uh, the Latin for to bring into being or in the sense of form out of nothing used of a divine or supernatural being. So creation is essentially a, a kind of activity of the gods. And when we are being creative, we are partaking of that a little bit. I'm thinking about, um, in a way, you know, the sort of the pros and cons of this, of, and it's linked with enthusiasm of being filled with the energy of the gods, that we can be filled up and swept away in wonderful ways, and we can be filled up and swept away um, in ways where we're uh, taken really uh, maybe not against our will, but um, by a will other than that that we typically associate with consciousness and our sense of self. And there are all kinds of stories about, um, you know, people who, you know, and Jung was one of them who wrote things like in a, a couple of days uh, taken over by creative, enthusiastic energy when we're uh, taken up like that, we are in the service of the gods. Yeah. And I think that, you know, what that brings up for me is the way that creativity requires a tiny bit of inflation. I mean, first of all, when I think of creativity and I think about it in my own life or the life of my analysands, I mean, sometimes it's, you know, writing a book or making a painting, but sometimes it's, you know, planning a really great birthday party for your kid or, just coming up with a really, really cool creative solution to some problem or getting really creative about your next vacation. It doesn't have to be a grand sweeping gesture, but whatever it is, it requires a little bit of an ability to say, I think I can do something bold. I think I can do something that's just a little bit beyond the ordinary. I think I can think a little bit bigger. So in that sense, there's something a little transgressive about being creative. And it does require us to be a bit filled up with a sense of possibility. Um, And obviously that can become dangerous if it gets too much. But I think we need a little bit of that. I remember in graduate school, learning about the diagnostic criteria for bipolar disorder. And one of the criteria, at least at that time, was something like, you know, kind of grandiosity, right? And we were taught if someone comes into your office and says that they're writing a book, that 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 might be an indication of grandiosity that might indicate perhaps bipolar disorder. (laughs) And so, you know, sometimes it's like, well, I'd really like to write a book, you know, am I being <laughs> grandiose? And and what I finally decided is, well, yes. And we all need a little, a little bit of that to undertake something creative. I wonder if it needs, uh, because I'm thinking, Lisa, that you have actually written a book um, that will be out next year about motherhood. But I'm thinking that uh, the boldness, I like that word a lot of I do dare to tackle this and I, I do have wind in my sails of enthusiasm and inflation, but also uh, that, that very sort of workmanlike activity. It didn't just descend on you um, in a basket from the heavens. Uh, it's sitting down at the computer or your easel or the piano, whatever it might be, and that there's an aspect of craftsmanship and dedication and dailiness and practice uh, that that also balances this sort of archetypal infusion of energy. Yeah, we have to take that bridge between the vision that's been born Mm -hmm. in the psyche and then the journey it takes to bring that forward And relative to this idea of creative audacity or the boldness to bring (laughs) it forward, it requires courage because I think as soon as an image comes into the consciousness, we already sense that there is or will be some degradation 
between the ideal of the image and the end product. And we have to be able to tolerate that translation and to know that it may never exactly incarnate what came to us initially. Yeah, I, I think Marie-Louise Monfranz touches on that in her book on creation myths and mentions it in relation to the fact that there are a number of creation myths where the creator makes a version of creation and then is like, you know, that's not quite right and destroys it all and, and remakes it, you know, that, that somehow it's, it can be hard to deliver our vision that comes from the, this divine place. And, you know, that, that is a real thing, I think, sometimes, that we just see it. We just see what it could be. And I, I, I remember the germ of the idea that be, later became this book. I mean, it was, it's, a, I don't know, it's like a 16-year-old idea at this point. But when it landed, I was like, whoa, you know, huh. and, and it was a spark, but it did require accepting, Joseph, what you're talking about, that it would be degraded, that it wouldn't be everything I had possibly imagined it could be. That is this kind of accepting ordinariness in a way that is all of our challenge. And Deb, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, you're talking about sort of, you know, s sitting your, your butt down in your chair and, and working on your drawing or your painting or your music or whatever it is. I think about that in terms of these two different kinds of creative energies that have images uh, in the Greek pantheon. One is Dionysus, which is filled with that inflation that we've been talking about or that audacity that you mentioned, Joseph. And it's ecstatic, which come the etymology of ecstasy is standing outside yourself. So when you're really swept up by this huge creative divine inspiration versus a different kind of relationship with a creative work. And that is pictured by Hephaestus. So Hephaestus was the kind of the blacksmith of the gods. He was actually married to Aphrodite, but she um, cheated on him with Mars because he was misshapen. He wasn't attractive. He wasn't sexy. But he just went down to his forge every day and literally hammered out these ideas and produced items of great beauty and magic. And there's a way that we need both in our creative pursuits. We need some Dionysus and we need some Hephaestus. I think a lot of artists understand the place of ecstasy, destruction, and chaos as part of their creative process. For instance, many artists have to work really hard to not be overly influenced by the collective, that they don't want to simply bring forward something that's a derivative of another person's work. So they have to be willing to break up a lot of their training, break up a lot of the images that they're being infested with from the collective, and really find clean ground inside of themselves, which is a tremendous discipline. I also think many artistic types or creative types need to challenge the places of rigidity inside of themselves, that one has to give up what the culture tells you is the normal attitude or the average way of being in order to allow the creative image to claim you, your time, your libido, claim you as its vessel, so to speak. I am struck by how much we're talking about the relationship uh, between ego and the unconscious. And if the ego is um, it's a sort of overly rigid, adheres very much to established norms and traditions and ways of doing things, you know, then there isn't room for that uh, Dionysian spirit of inspiration to really come in and, and take enough hold. On the other hand, if the ego structure does, isn't sort of solid enough some of those unconscious forces with their archetypal roots can sort of take hold of a person and wreak havoc in that person's life. 
you know, there, there are all kinds of stories about um, great geniuses like uh, Van Gogh or Nietzsche who, who were overtaken by the powers of the unconscious. So I'm really liking um, your analogy, Lisa, to Dionysus and Hephaestus, that it takes both uh, the Dionysian spirit from uh, the unconscious to do something bold and new and visionary, and the Hephaestian get down there to your blacksmith uh, bellows <laughs> and and just work it. Well, it's like that expression, what is it, you know, genius is 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration or something like that. But that's sort of the formula we're talking about. Yeah. There has to be a relationship between those two elements. This brings to mind uh, Ernest Hemingway, that Hemingway apparently was incredibly disciplined. He wrote for eight hours a day. He got up in the morning. He wrote for eight hours. He stopped at eight hours. And then the Dionysic part of his life would take over for another eight hours and he would drink wildly and he'd go and like shoot an alligator somewhere, you know, (laughs) and then, you know, pet his six toed cats, you know, and then fall asleep in a drunken haze. Then he got up and he wrote for eight hours. Wow. So his life seemed to exemplify this dance between Hephaestus Mm -hmm. and Dionysus. I've got another historical example, too. The composer Handel, when he was uh, composing The Messiah, he apparently wrote it in just 24 days. And the story is that he wasn't sleeping or eating very much. And assistants would bring him meals. They'd come back later. The meals would be uneaten. His servants would come in and he would be in tears. And the, the, the story is that he told his servant after finishing the Hallelujah Chorus I did think I did see all heaven before me and the great God himself seated on his throne with his company of angels. Mm. So uh, now I don't know if that story is apocryphal or not, but I found it online. So it must be true. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But, but it's, it's just, it's a great image though of just having been the recipient of this completely transcendent divine inspiration that is captured in that music. So there's a cost and a gift. And it reminds me of another idea that Jung brought forward that like Prometheus, to steal something from the gods and to bring it through the unconscious and into an incarnate life mm-hmm. comes at a cost. Yep. Well, we we seem to be on a roll with Greek myths today. And um, <laughs> uh, that brings to mind the, the Greek myth of Arachne, who uh, brought something forth at great cost. Uh, she was a weaver, and uh, uh, she dared to make a weaving that was of such perfection that she basically taunted Athena uh, with her powers and her prowess, and uh, Athena punished her by turning her into a spider, that very ordinary and prolific uh, weaver of webs. So we encroach on this kind of territory that has historically been imaged as godlike or from the gods. I think we have to do it with awareness. Yeah, that there, there is a, a danger of inflation in it that can bring us low. Yeah. But I, I think for most of us out there, most of our listeners, mm-hmm. it, it's almost going to be the opposite, right? That we that we don't allow ourselves to embark on something creative when we feel the impulse that we meet the inner cynic that Linda Leonard talks about in her book. Linda Leonard is a Jungian analyst. She has a wonderful book about creativity called The Call to Create. She has a whole chapter on meeting the cynic. You know, it's that part that says, oh, you know, you can, who, who do you think you are? You yeah, can't do this. No one's going no to be interested in that, you know. A dumb idea. Mm-hmm. It's shaming ourselves into remaining hidden. That there's a cost to being seen. And for something so vulnerable that's come through us from the unconscious to represent us to be a proxy for us in a way in the collective is incredibly vulnerable. 
And how does one steel oneself for what the collective is or isn't going to do to us? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm thinking that that cynic, that's such an important point, uh, comes up because we get very identified with the outcome. Uh, that will it be good enough? I'm linking it to the being seen, that the uh, my vision and yet the product that results from that is very ordinary, or people think it's silly, or, you know, that poem is just falls totally flat, versus having a process with ourselves that links us up to something internal in ourself, regardless of whether the eventual out pro uh, product is, you know, sort of genius or not, or that it's not subject to that kind of evaluative uh, process. That's not the way to measure creativity. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that this is an interesting place, though, Deb, and I've thought about this a lot, and I don't have it worked out. But I think what you're raising is the very legitimate point that doing something creative is in and of itself inherently rewarding. It's something that we all have an urge to do. We all need to express ourselves. We all need to be creative in whatever way. I mean, maybe it's just making dinner, <laughs> whatever way that works for us. And there is a way in which at least some of the time we want our creative outputs to be seen and enjoyed. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I'm just cooking for myself, I just, it's a pretty utilitarian endeavor. But if I'm making dinner for friends, I put a little extra effort in. I'm, I'm more creative and, and I, want, I want them to say, this is great. So I think sometimes we do really need to have our outputs seen and received. Uh, I was back on the idea of the cynic uh, of, oh, that's not, you know, that won't work. That's not good. And, you know, somebody that I knew years ago who is hardly alone in this, who took a year off in order to write a novel. Wow. And he did. And at the end of the year, it was sort of like, well, you know, what was it like? And so on and so forth. And he said, oh, he said, it's, it was terrible. He said it was really terrible. And then that the, the project was done, but he had had access to his own creative energy and, in, and his ability to invest in that and pay the literal price of, uh, you know, sort of the traditional living in a garret, uh, eating beans kind of life for a year. And it fueled him for another whole endeavor and a very successful career in a field that was related to writing. And, and that's what I meant when it's not necessarily tied to product mm -hmm. or outcome, mm -hmm. but uh, trusting yourself and having the courage uh, to create that energy can be channeled in other directions. Yeah, you, you don't know where it's going to go. Yeah. But you might need to follow it. Right. And there's a difference between marketing the creative product and offering the creative product. It may be that um, this person may offer the novel just to his friends or do a, a private publishing so that it can incarnate in the world. And, and it may not be in him to spend an enormous time marketing it, but that it does have a life beyond the creator somewhere in the world. It survives us in an important way. I did want to jump back a little bit, um, Lisa, when you were talking about the multiple ways that a creative image can incarnate through us, and sometimes in very ordinary ways or ways the culture would think is ordinary, I was thinking about that great movie, Babette's Feast. Mm. Oh, yes. Where, you know, she has this incredible creative image of uh, the perfect culinary feast, and she has the skills to bring this forward, but her circumstances have prevented her from being able to, to create this event, a kind of artistic installation. And she comes into a, a sum of money that she doesn't expect, and there's a great conundrum about what will she do with that. And she decides that she's going to fund this extraordinary feast for a group of her neighbors and simply observe how they respond, which is with great joy and gusto. And 
to bring her vision into this fullness, even though, you know, like a sand painting, it's temporal, seemed to be everything that she needed in that moment. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great example to bring in. What I remember from that movie, and I'm so glad you brought it in, is uh, she's living as sort of an expat in a Scandinavian community where people are pretty staid and life is pretty simple. And that as the people sit and enjoy this meal, they warm up, they get chatty, uh, they are enlivened and brought into touch with each other and with themselves in these incredible ways. And that's what I think I keep pointing to is what we find just in our relationship with the spirit of creativity, that there is something more of ourselves we can discover. It's not disconnected with the process or the product, but it's not cause and effect either. Yeah, and it's deeply satisfying. It really gives us access to the riches of the inner world. When we're doing something creative, we often achieve that state of flow where we just feel like we are in right relationship with the self, as it were. Mm -hmm. it, it can be a deeply, deeply gratifying experience to do something creative. They are experiences of wholeness. That is not to be missed, whether it's making a meal or being bold enough to take on a much bigger project. I found myself reflecting on the way in which the culture often finds manifestations of the self dangerous and transgressive. I think every great religious leader, we talk about Jesus, bringing forward a new way of imagining deity or imagining how humanity would relate to it was considered a, a massive transgressor, somebody that was sh shocking and breaking the laws and expectations of the culture. Yeah, and had to be killed. Had to be executed. But even now, art is considered transgressive and dangerous and in, in very regulated cultures in some countries right now to create uh, a cartoon of a political leader can land you in jail mm -hmm. uh, as being disrespectful, showing anything but one particular vision of the political leader. Also, people who publish books that have radical ideas compared to the cultural norm, again, are often considered dangerous. And we have a long history in the United States of banning books and uh, book burnings because ideas are considered dangerous when they don't reflect the status quo. Yes, uh, the radical images um, in writing or art or any one of a number of other things are really threaten uh, an established, rigid, or simply traditional order. Uh, so there's an inherent kind of opposition, isn't there, uh, between creativity and a kind of uh, civilized uh, rigidity. And that instead of holding the tension of those two opposites of this is the way we do things in order to maintain a certain kind of civic order, it goes to one side or the other that then we can have revolution if the if the civic order is overly rigid uh, v versus um, a creative dialogue between new ideas and an order that is flexible and uh, permeable enough to receive them. I have a quote from Rollo May's book, The Courage to Create. He's so marvelously articulate about these dimensions. He writes, dogmatists of all kinds, scientific, economic, moral, as well as political, are threatened by the creative freedom of the artist. This is necessarily and inevitably so. We cannot escape our anxiety over the fact that the artists, together with creative persons of all sorts, 
are the possible destroyers of our nicely ordered systems. For the creative impulse is the speaking of the voice and the expressing of the forms of the preconscious and the unconscious, and this is by its very nature a threat to rationality and external control. The dogmatists then try to take over the artist. The church in certain periods harnessed him to prescribed subjects and methods. Hmm. You know, where, where that takes me, Joseph, is the way that creativity can feel transgressive or dangerous in our own lives and perhaps even in our own intimate relationships. So that you're going along, you've got the kids, you've got the job, whatever. And let's say something wells up in you, a desire to be creative, an image of something new, a new attitude, a new um, way to approach something. M maybe it's actually a creative endeavor, but, but maybe it's just a new way of being in the relationship or in your life. And it can feel very scary. It can feel scary uh, because it's going to upset the way things are. It's going to upset the established order. And it might be that your your partner or your spouse doesn't like it either. Let's not change the way things are because, you know, this has been working fine. Thank you very much. So <laughs> you, what? You want to go back to graduate school? You know, how are we going to take, who's going to take care of the kids or, or whatever it is, whatever form it takes, the way that the creative impulse threatens to um, upset the established order, even in our own psyches and our own lives. Yes. Uh, Jung says it very succinctly. Nothing can be created without destruction. Yeah. And, and, we, wow. and we tend to resist and even fear uh, the destructive aspect of this duality. And that it's a requirement for the artist. It's a sacrifice whether it's a sacrifice of time and resources, a sacrifice in terms of tensions between the family members or our loved ones, a sacrifice between how we may be unreceived or criticized by the culture once we introduce it. And yet there is this compelling demand that this idea be brought forward. Yeah, I'm thinking about what Jim Hollis said a couple of weeks ago when he was on the podcast, what wants to come into the world through you? You know, in some sense, that's a question that really addresses creativity. And what happens if we don't meet that demand? What happens if it's too scary, if it feels like it's going to cost us too much, be too disruptive, we can't handle the thought of the destruction that will be wrought? You know, what happens if we deny our creative impulses? I think that shows up in the consulting room really, really frequently. If not right at the beginning, sooner or later, people will confess that they've been thinking about, fill in the blank, thinking about a book, um, maybe even writing it in their minds. But there's something in the psyche that blocks their ability to take a step forward or they've been thinking about taking painting classes because they had a dream and they want to bring an image forward or even something like thinking about relocating to another part of the world because they have a creative vision of who they would be and how they would live in this other place and one of the things that happens is these creative images haunt them like hungry ghosts, constantly whispering to them and sometimes pounding on the door, wanting to be given a chance at being born. And sometimes when this creative image is denied over and over again, it becomes a neurosis, that it creates a kind of splitting in the psyche. And people can become very uncomfortable, if not unwell. Often it can bring on a kind of creative depression in someone. If the self is determined, finally, that you will pay attention to this emerging image, it will begin to steal energy from other endeavors, and people will find themselves no longer enjoying the pastimes that they had before. The ego will be 
grabbed by the unconscious and stuck in a mood until they develop an introspective stance, until the outer world loses its grip on them through a depression. And then finally, hopefully, the image that they have been refusing feels possible and in fact even more beautiful than the life that they were clinging to. Well, Joseph, you know, you're you're leaning there into how this can show up in the consulting room and, and people's lives as well. And it certainly is true that many people come into an analysis feeling that they're blocked in their creativity. Right? So I'm wondering if we can talk about that a little bit. And I'll I'll just start off by saying that one of the things that I see is that when a woman has had a wounded relationship with her father, she may have a great deal of difficulty claiming her creativity. That is one constellation that I sometimes see. You know, we think about the animus as being related to a woman's creativity. And if you've had a very wounded relationship with your father, then you probably have a dark, perhaps persecutory, animus energy that can really dog you and make it difficult for you to believe in your own creative potential, um, for you to give yourself permission to to do that. You, you might have to really, it might be a real uphill battle. I have seen that in my own practice. I can think of one situation where a woman had been nursing a substantial book, had researched it, had taken tremendous notes. It was really organized in her mind. And because, as you just exactly outlined, uh, a very ambivalent relationship to the masculine across the lifespan, she couldn't find enough agency to do the next leg of the journey, which was substantial, of course, to write and self-publish and learn all these things that would be required for her. Coming into analysis, because the transference was very positive, what I noticed is that her animus came to life rather quickly, became, was projected on me, and I acted for a little while as a kind of muse. And this is some of the best ways that the analyst can be used as a creative screen in which an analysand can then have access to an energy which is really inside themselves, and then over time begin to reclaim the projection and find that there is an inner masculine figure, as this woman did, inside of her that cheers her on and provides both the support and the vitality that she needs to move forward with the creative project. You know, and I just want to say for just a second while we're here, because we're talking about women's creativity, I think it is different trying to be a creative woman than a creative man in general, perhaps just because of the nature of our culture. I think it's easier for a man to give himself permission to, you know, create a studio in the garage and go out there and try to record songs every weekend. Whereas for a woman, it can be really, really difficult to say, I'm going to be selfish. I'm going to carve this time out. I'm not going to make dinner for the family or I'm going to hire a babysitter to be with the kids so that I can go do something creative. That, that can be tricky when you're a woman. So I'm wondering if uh, what we're talking about is the ability to harness one's own aggression and sense of me first. Uh, and then to manage the chaos, that uh, can, the inner turmoil that is often associated with a creative process. A and that there, there may be a difference between uh, women and men in that regard, uh, where it's transgressive in terms of cultural norms. And there's also always that danger. Now we have all these famous stories of uh, artists of all kinds getting swept away by the powers of the unconscious. I'm really thinking about the possible gender differences around creativity. And actually, I really wish that I had more information about it, a little bit more research at my hands. But I'm thinking that in the culture of American men, 
if the creativity will allow them to indirectly increase both status and wealth, there can be a very unobstructed channel to that. There's a way in which one can expect to be applauded for um, founding a, a company that generates a new product that's highly uh, valued. I think that it's more difficult for men to commit to a creative endeavor, let's say like you know, being a painter or being a poet, because status and wealth are uncertain outcomes in certain creative endeavors. And having worked with some uh, visual artists and poets, writers, there is a great pain that they are not feeling as successful financially mm -hmm. as their cohorts and don't feel supported by the culture of men in that way. I think it's complicated. You know, what this takes me to is the idea of um, that we've been talking about is that creativity is an individual endeavor, uh, harnessing one's own individual potential for whatever it is. Uh, and yet, uh, here are the three of us doing something together. And that relatedness is also very much an intrinsic part of creativity, of brainstorming with someone. You know, let, let me bounce this off you. I had an idea for. And I, I just want to throw in here something that I think is really important, which is we don't have to do it alone. Uh, support is available and that there is a relational context uh, that is also very possible and makes access to creativity not feel quite so isolated and um, a feeling too far out on some kind of limb. Yeah, and there are some kind of creative projects that welcome that kind of collaboration more than others. Mm. I'm thinking about uh, in the performing arts, very, very often it's a really enormous team effort you know most musicals for instance are there's a team of lyricists and there's musicians there's many levels of creative input just to produce the script and then of course bringing it forward into life there's so many creative people and actors and dancers musicians who all collaborate to bring it forward I think what you're saying, Deb, that, which I also like and reminds me a bit of the story I had recounted a minute ago, is sometimes we need to be companioned externally, whether or not that person co-creates with us, because being creative can be lonely and anxiety-provoking and sometimes even torturous, and that we need some kind of support, friendship, and companionship from other people. Yeah, and Joseph, related to what you're saying and kind of coming back to this idea about blocks to creativity, I think there often are inner voices that tell us, you know, we were talking before about the cynic, but I think there are other voices besides that 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 can really tell us that, um, you know, we don't have any business trying this or, or that it's really more important that we get the laundry done or um, that if we just wait longer, you know, we'll, we'll be better off if we just start next month or, you know, any number of things that get in the way of us really engaging in it. So th that there is a way that an analytic process can kind of midwife a creative process because it can be the ground upon which these tender shoots get protected and uh, nurtured when they're still very, very delicate. You know, I'm aware that we have not yet linked uh, creativity to something that is intrinsic in Jungian thought, which is active imagination, uh, and that that is a tried and true uh, channel to the discovery of one's internal and autonomous creative unconscious life. Yes, if we think of active imagination as a way of cultivating a conversation with the source of these innovative images, there is an enormous wellspring, not only of specific ideas, 
but of moods that can liberate us so that we can move forward and not be merely stuck. Relative to that, Deb, uh, I'm also reminded of um, Jung's attitude that dreams themselves are evidence of creativity. Mm -hmm. He writes, dreams are neither mere reproductions of memories nor abstractions from experience. They are the undisguised manifestations of unconscious creative activity. And they are so creative, aren't they? They really are. Yes. That there is another in us whom we do not know and who talks to us every night in dreams. And creates Mm -hmm. theater for us. I mean, the theater of a dream every night. Even though people wouldn't imagine themselves as being film directors, for instance, but something inside of you has cast and filmed often extraordinary events. Mm You know, I'm I'm wondering if the two of you would indulge me in talking about creativity uh, through a fairy tale. Um, and I, I'm going to talk about the elves and the shoemaker. And I, I want to credit um, uh, the author Alan Chinnon, who is a, I believe he's, he's a psychiatrist who writes about fairy tales. And I really love his books. And, and he talks about the elves and the shoemaker in Once Upon a Midlife. So, uh, a lot of my ideas about this fairy tale are um, inspired by by that book. But if you know the tale, there's a poor shoemaker who uh, he's not doing well. His shoes are not selling and he keeps on uh, making shoes and then not having quite enough money once he sold the pair to buy enough leather to basically his his money is dwindling. His resources are dwindling. So we start out in the beginning of the tale with a, a, an image of psychic poverty, of creative poverty. He can sell a pair of shoes, but then he has to choose between buying leather or buying food. So there's that sense of not enough. And we can feel like that when we're in a creative process, that maybe we have an idea and... Um, We can write five pages, but when we come to the end of the fifth page, we're just done. We don't have any more ideas. We don't know where it's going to go next. But the shoemaker has the right attitude. He has the right attitude toward the unconscious because what he does is when he's running out of leather, he says, there's a very last bit of leather. It's enough for one pair of shoes. And he just very diligently cuts it out. And, and leaves it on his workbench that night and goes to sleep. So it's this, I, it's this way where when we're in a creative process and we're struggling and we're in that impoverished state, we still just show up and do the best we can and the unconscious will come to meet us. So what happens to the shoemaker is he leaves the leather on his workbench that night and <laughs> lo, And behold, these elves come and scamper about and find the leather and they sew up the most exquisitely beautiful pair of shoes. So when the shoemaker wakes up in the morning, oh my gosh, there's this beautiful pair of shoes and he's able to sell it for so much money that he has plenty for food and he's also able to buy enough leather for two new pairs of shoes. And uh, he does the same thing that night. He cuts it out and he leaves it on his workbench and the elves come and they make the shoes. And this continues in this fashion and the shoemaker is getting wealthier and wealthier and he's becoming known for making these really, really beautiful shoes. And for, for me, this is a little bit like, I'll, I'll just share a little bit of my own creative process. I, um, I like to write in small chunks. So I will wake up a little early and just tell myself that I'm going to write for 15 or 20 minutes or, or 300 words is what I usually tell myself. And partly I do that because I don't really have time to do it any other way. But it also works really beautifully because I find that I can always come up with 300 words of something to say. Uh-huh. And and sometimes that's it. And then I'm just done. But guess what? That's all I needed to do. So I, I set it aside and I go take the, my shower. And when I'm in the shower, I'm like, oh, oh, I know what I need to do next, you know? And so I jot it down and I go about my day and it's in my thoughts the rest of the day. And then when I wake up in the morning, I've got 300 more words. And it it just, it's the way that if you draw upon the well of the unconscious, it always refills. And, but there, there is this joining with it. There's a partnering with it where you need to kind of do your work. You need to cut out your shoe leather. You need to get up in the morning and write for 15 minutes. 
And then just trust that the unconscious will come with the rest of it. So getting back to the fairy tale for a second, what eventually happens is the shoemaker and his wife are very grateful and they they don't understand what's happening, but they decide to wait up one night and see who it is that's doing this for them. And they see the elves and in their gratitude, they decide that they're going to make some clothes for the elves. So they make these beautiful little outfits and they leave them out for the elves on, on Christmas night. And the elves come and they find the clothes and they put them on and they scamper about and they're so happy. And then they don't come back. You know, they've been seen, the magic has shifted, and now it's just up to the shoemaker to continue to make shoes, which he does, and the tale ends happily. But there is a way in which the task of a creative endeavor maybe starts off with some of that divine magic elf energy that would sort of be like the Dionysus energy we were talking about before. And eventually, we've just got to do the heavy, heavy lifting and be Hephaestus and just just make our shoes. That's really a wonderful uh, tale and your own experience with it uh, also, Lisa. What I'm taking from that is uh, do what you can. Uh, start small. The shoemaker cut out a pair of shoes. That was all he had. It was all he could do. It's very ordinary. It's not very much. Or you writing 300 words. Of, okay, I can write 300 words. And that the faith and uh, the trust in psyche, it is inherently generative. Uh, Your image of the well, there's water in the well. And that seems to me to be just psychic fact. And if we could hold on to that just as a cognition, uh, it will help us go there. To me, it has something to do with the maturation of the personality, that to be carried by the creative daimon in the beginning is rather childlike. I've certainly known people and had the experience of myself that something just writes itself through me. (laughs) And it's easy to feel like, oh, well, then we're just done. You know, I've just kind of pooped out something onto the paper and (laughs) with, with no effort at all. Joseph, I've seen you do that, and it's amazing. (laughs) Once in a while, but not always. (laughs) And that at a certain point, when we or if we discover the conduits through which that flows in the psyche, then in that same moment of discovery, the responsibility for it now rests in our own hands. Mm -hmm. What we haven't talked about yet that I think built on what you just said, Joseph, is the role that passion or love, dedication, and devotion uh, has to do with creativity, that we have to keep on repeatedly going there, no matter what it is, and that the shoemaker does that. There's an implicit image of devotion uh, to doing what he can with his two tiny scraps of leather, uh, and creativity is associated with uh, with kind of positive emotions. And I'm going to add to that a sense of service. Uh, going back to what you said, Lisa, about how Jim Hollis said, "What wants to come into the world through you? Of what are we serving?" Um, and that that may be uh, something that balances. Uh, the difference between the Dionysian energy and the the energy of Hephaestus is that we're in service to something. Uh, the shoemaker is in service to his craft, his livelihood, uh, to doing what he can, even if it's pretty paltry in terms of the materials that he has access to. That you do what you can. I can write 300 words. And that if we are in service to something um, worthy, something a little larger than ourselves, something that really matters and has value, that that kind of feeling and devotion uh, is also um, likely to result in more creativity. The elves are likely to come. So maybe we should invoke our own little elves and, <laughs> uh, and work on a dream. Okay. (laughs) 
Hi, this is Joseph from this Jungian Life podcast. Lisa, Deb, and I have been deeply moved by your responses to our work. Producing, editing, and distributing it involves substantial expenses, and now we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisjungianlife.com, and click on the heading Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us with as little as a dollar a month. And at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Thank you. The dreamer is 34 years old, female, is an actor and a writer. Here's the dream. I dreamt last night that my agent, and a very good friend, had died. But while she was dead, she was still conscious. She was walking around and we were chatting, but she knew she was dead too. Over what seemed like a few days, she was decaying and there was a smell, but we were still in this one room chatting. I remember feeling slightly scared and would hold my breath around her. She knew she would have to be buried soon, and there was a sense of us getting ready for that. But the burial never happened. There was no goodbye or funeral, or perhaps I just woke up. She gives us a bit of context for the dream. She writes, I'm an actor, but I haven't had any acting work for a couple of years until two days ago. I had been happily pursuing other goals, writing, recently finishing a master's, launching her own business. But my agent and good friend always kept me in her books, and I finally landed a nice job. But I no longer just identify myself as an actor. There's more to life than that now. She says that the main feelings in the dream were disturbed, grossed out, sad, unnerved. She gives a bit more explanation and says, Her husband, also a very good friend and colleague, was in the dream too, and he was naturally enough distraught. But I kept thinking, But she's not really dead, we can still talk to her. Even though she was decaying before our eyes. Talk about creative. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is a very creative dream, isn't it? My thoughts about this dream are, uh, first of all, we don't know much about the friend who's, who's died. And uh, I wish I knew just a bit more about that aspect of the dream. We might imagine that it is um, some aspect of the dreamer, dreamer's shadow, perhaps. But it also does seem like it relates, and I suspect that the dreamer herself believes it relates to her changed attitude toward acting. So this is her friend, but it's also her agent who gets her the acting jobs. And so it might be an aspect of her psyche. The, the friend might represent an aspect of her psyche that is kind of identified with being an actor. And here that content is kind of just gradually decaying. It's not particularly dramatic. There's no big send off. But it just may be kind of cataloging an inner psychic shift around how she conceptualizes herself mm -hmm. and that she no longer sees herself as an actor. I mean, I think that's one, likely one yeah. level of this dream. I'm going back to uh, Jung's succinct statement about nothing can be created without destruction and how in the context of the dream, uh, she's been doing lots of other things uh, while she was in this place of not getting much work as an actor. She got a, a master's degree. She launched her own business. She's writing. And so I wonder, um, you know, if new life has uh, come on board in her waking life uh, uh, that eclipses her past identification with being an actor. 
And it's still there walking around, uh, you know, in, in the room uh, as her agent who got her the job. Um, but it's decaying and there's a smell and so on. There's no real life in her past vocation. I'm thinking about this alchemically. Mm. And I'm finding myself thinking about the putrefactio. Mm-hmm. When something psycho-spiritually dies, its effect on the system is not complete, but that something needs to putrefy, it needs to rot down to its basic material in order for its inherent properties to be liberated. This happens all the time just with the mulch in your garden. You know, your mulch needs to break down over the course of a winter or two in order to release its nutrients and to be used effectively to improve the soil. So she is in a transition, as as both of you had noted, and the psyche is not fully completed, this letting go, that the agent's spirit, so to speak, has not been liberated yeah. from the decaying flesh. Yeah. Of course, at some point, this vehicle, the decaying flesh, is going to fall away. It remains to be seen whether the spirit of the agent will still be talking to her or what's going to happen. But some form of a liberation is at hand. And the liberating process evokes a certain amount of disgust in the dream ego. And I find that particularly interesting. Um, Disgust is um, one of the primal emotions that infants feel right at birth. In terms of infant affect studies, anger, fear, disgust, some even say shame, are a a palette of primal feelings that we inherit just right from the beginning. And of course, we need disgust as an instinct because an infant needs to know, based on kind of just ancient survival, that if something smells or tastes a certain way, it's dangerous to have in one's proximity or at least dangerous to ingest. So when I think about the feeling of disgust with the agent, it's a reinforcement in the instinctive level of the psyche that getting too close, taking something in is going to be toxic or damaging to you. It's a way of making sure that you keep the distance from whatever she represents. Yeah, I I like what you did with the decaying there, Joseph. It was such a big part of the dream and and so obviously very important. You know, I'm I'm this might be a bit of a reach, but I'm noticing that she's 34, which in our modern day is a little young for a midlife crisis, but certainly is in the age range that that Jung thought of where one could have a a midlife crisis. And I'm thinking about a dream that Jung had about a death. And I believe he was around the same age, although someone's probably going to write in and tell me I'm wrong, but he had a dream that he killed Siegfried. And part of the significance of a very significant dream for him and and part of the meaning of it, I'm just going to kind of dance over it, was that this heroic attitude associated with the first half of life needed to be sacrificed. And it, it there may be something similar going on here that a kind of youthful, heroic or grandiose dream, perhaps, of being an actor is something that needs to be that needs to be sacrificed here, it needs to die. I find myself just thinking about the archetype of the agent, that what is an agent? And in the acting world, an agent is, you know, has a very specific role. An agent, you know, links an actor to any number of venues who are producing work for them, paid or unpaid that they create a kind of linking process. The agent also is in charge of cultivating these various business uh, relationships with producers and, and finding a stable of actors who can reliably meet their needs. 
The agent is a middleman who takes a portion of the money in between. The agent is someone who's behind the scenes, is not in front of the stage. For many people in a large acting market like Manhattan or L.A., an agent is the only way to even get an introduction to these inner relationships with producers who are not available. And also sort of a, a, a kind of guardian of the threshold, as it were, you know, a kind of gatekeeper. Mm -hmm. A kind of parent. Well, I'm, of course, it's related to the word agency, uh, you know, one's own sense of efficacy and ability to uh, make things happen. And uh, I, I like your uh, discussion of agents in theater. Of, I don't have that agency. I need an agent to perform that linking function, get me over the threshold and into work. But but here, I wonder if she's coming into her own agency, and so she doesn't need an agent anymore. She knew she would have to be buried soon, and there was a sense of us getting ready for that. Uh, but there was no goodbye or funeral. So, uh, But it seems like something is t taking place in the psyche that um, an old needed function uh, has died is still sort of around in a ghostly kind of way, but um, it's starting to stink. Along those lines, what I would suggest is, given that she's launching her own business, that the projection of all the roles of the agent have to be absorbed into her. That the idea that I can't do all those things, somebody else has to negotiate on my behalf to make sure that I have a living to go to these other production environments. It also assigns the agent to certain things. And many actors, my friends who are actors in New York, don't even pursue independent opportunities. They've just assigned that role to a third party. And in a sense, kind of disavowed themselves of any of the capacity to generate their own work. So relative to this entrepreneurial spirit that's emerging in her, the image that's assigned to the agent has to drop away and all those nutrients of creative audacity, of, of handshaking and negotiating and contracts and business, that's all got to get absorbed back into the groundwork of her psyche and then her little tap roots. I've got to drink in that vitality and let it sprout up in her new waking personality so that she can carry all of that as part of herself. I also wonder if there is something um, here in the contrast between being an actor in which we play a role that's not really myself or whatever that role is, and all the things that she has been engaged in that really are herself. Uh, it's her own self that does the writing, that earned the master's degree, and um, is launching her own business versus pretending to be, you know, whatever the part is that's assigned in a play or a TV show. Uh, a sense of her really wanting to be herself in this world rather than acting, in some sense, psychically as well as professionally. She's coming into being, in a way. So I overall feel very positive about the dream. Mm -hmm. And even though there's some really yes. ambivalent um, sensations, she feels grossed out, sad, unnerved. I think those are perfectly reasonable transitional feelings. Mm-hmm as she's getting ready to let go of something and take something on for herself. Yeah. I wonder how her relationship to this acting gig that she's currently got is also going to change. I wonder that too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, she wants to be an actor in her own life as in someone who acts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've been listening to This Jungian Life, from our website, thisunionlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, 
Help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.